Hello and welcome to another big UC News Show. My name is David Dungay. Today we're going to be talking about the latest and greatest news stories from the market. Uh, let's do a quick round of introductions. Uh, today I have with me uh, Evan Kerstell, Mr. Social Media himself. Welcome to the show. Urban Lazar, Zayas Caravalla, John Arnold and Craig Durr. Welcome everyone. I hope you're well. Uh, let's get straight into our first news story of the day, and that is going to be Verizon calling curtains on blue jeans. Uh, this sent shockwaves through the market. Uh, earlier, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Verizon sent an email to its employees stating it's going to sunset the service due to, and I quote, evolving and volatile market situations. Uh, what does this mean? Well, Verizon uh, spent an estimated between four and five hundred million dollars uh, in spring 2020 on blue jeans. This was at the height of the pandemic, you know, just when everyone was going mad, trying to get that hybrid working technology within their business. And uh, clearly it hasn't quite uh, worked out. So over the next coming uh, few weeks, there will be a wind, a wind down of different parts of the service. You won't be able to acquire the service as new and there'll be some sort of support for existing users so i guess the big question from my side is you know how has uh, how has this happened how has verizon been unable to convert uh, its investments you know during a time where we all need hybrid work hybrid work is all around us who should we go to first craig do you want to kick us off what are your thoughts in this situation yeah um i tell you this this was a surprise uh, like you said it's 2020 was the investment timeline and here we are three years later and they're divesting of it um you know you look at what they did it was definitely they were that buy borrow build point decision with the pandemic i need to have some kind of a video conferencing service integrated into what we're doing and so they went for the buy option right but I, but uh, what i could take from this is they have been challenged to convert either existing verizon customer base over to that blue jean service or grow new customers net new um, i think they tried both strategies but the internal harvesting i did not pick up on um large transition of people who are using the Verizon services for business telephony and things of that nature, using that also for the unified communications or as an entryway into the unified communications inclusive of video. Um, I, I just think it was, uh, it was an example of, uh, they weren't able to properly integrate it. They weren't pay, able to get that proper conversion rate going. Yeah, I think we all spent too much money during the pandemic, right, Zias? I mean, we didn't spend 500 million on blue jeans, but we spent, you know, too much money on Amazon. And uh, but all, all kidding aside, uh, it, it, I think it shows the challenges that Verizon and its peer AT and T have in the enterprise, and that they're they're kind of the Walmart of enterprise communications. Great when you you know what you need to buy, you go in the store and pick it off the shelf, and you get a pretty good price. But that's not going to sell and market and position you as a product in the uh, quote unquote Walmart uh, 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 store there. So uh, that's what was lacking. It was that that go to market, that selling, that marketing, that positioning, that hyper competitive uh, landscape and video that they um, sadly couldn't uh, you know differentiate themselves from. And they're competing against their partners. I mean, you know, they, they have a very strong partner relationship with Microsoft, with Cisco. Uh, Sound of WebEx and Microsoft Teams. So, what what's the use case for for Blue Jeans? Um, yeah, you know, it's it's just hard for them to make that argument to their customers. The market doesn't differentiate on standalone video anymore. Pexip is still around. I don't understand that, but you know, those pure plays for video is just not a market for it. And Zoom is just you know, and Teams for that matter have kind of obliterated all of that. And uh, frankly, I think you'd agree, Zayas, it would have been money better spent if they just hired Otani. They, they, they would get yeah. way more eyeballs from him just watching him than getting people to use blue jeans, right? Yeah, you know, Verizon's always willing to do what the customer wants, right? And that's why they have so many UC relationships. The problem is, is it's not really, they're a multi-headed dragon in in UC. They've, as you said earlier, they get the blue, the, the, they have the, um, the, the, they've had the WebEx relationship for a long time. They're big into Microsoft Teams. They have a Ring Central partnership now. And so where does blue jeans fit in all that? I think initially they thought they could sell it down market to small customers, you know, as part of an overall bundle. But even those customers tended to use Zoom and things at home. I think if they had really wanted to have blue jeans, um, if, they'd, if they'd go back in time, they, they might have created a, 
kind of freemium version of blue jeans and tried to seed the market down market at least at least give it to the home subscribers to use as a you know to talk to your loved ones or something like that and look to build it that way but it just it just seems like the and i've been saying this for a while in the uc market the 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 demand the supply far outweighs the demand today right and especially with microsoft taking up so big a chunk of the market and so blue jeans is a good product i just don't think there's really it's a solution looking for a problem though it just doesn't do anything that's all that differentiated from anybody yeah we, you made that comment earlier i mean the video quality across all these platforms are, are pretty much getting to be on par and it's difficult to d distinguish so it says other value adds as other selling opportunities that these guys just weren't able to get alignment and you were right i think there was a strong smb play or a hope for that uh but there was no uptake um maybe those guys yeah. are looking for what aligns with their productivity suites like teams or what aligns with other investments they have like zoom so it was a challenge. Great. So, uh, Zayas, you mentioned Zoom there. Let's go on to our next uh, big story. Um, that is Zoom Phone. Uh, straight off the back of a Zoom earnings call just last week, that Zoom Phone has hit half a billion dollars in revenues. Um, it's a really interesting story there. Zoom just keeps getting stronger. Uh, Eric Wan, CEO, highlighted some AI features there, like uh, intelligent director, meeting summaries, are really the sort of major operational things going on, driving, uh, driving the products. Um, this is pretty positive for Zoom. There's been a bit of negative press recently, though, um, with their return to the office. Not going down too well if you've been on social media recently. You'll have seen Eric duking it out with some of the haters online, which is uh, quite interesting to watch. But uh, Zoom is not the same company it was uh, just a few years ago. You know, we've seen them go into different areas, the contact center being the, the most the most prominent. So I guess a big question, should we go to to Erwin for this one? You know, Zoom's it's a bit of a more of a complete solution than you know a lot of people realize today. And um, you know, what do you make of these sort of numbers around around its earnings call. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously seeing the growth in Zoom phone is impressive. Um, Zoom, Zoom's unique in this space. If you think about the other UCAS providers that are more often trying to find how do we play nicely with Microsoft and how do we carve out a niche? Zoom's going head on. Uh, they bought Work Vivo, which competes with Microsoft Vivo. They added email and calendar last year. They still kind of lack, you know, some of the, the MDM and um, other functionality, you know, document uh, creation and file management and so on that that, that Microsoft has. But I, I think the vision of Zoom is, you know, platform, platform, platform. We heard that at uh, they had an analyst event a few weeks ago called Zoom Perspectives, and they're they're trying to present themselves as a true alternative. Uh, for companies that, that want to look at something other than Microsoft and maybe save some money and get better performance and features. Uh, in our research, we find that you know if users are given the choice and they have ex exposure to both apps, Teams or, or, or Zoom, they tend to prefer Zoom. Uh, we saw a lot of uh, positive feedback on the Zoom voice uh, solution in some research we just published. So. Yeah, I, I think it's it's impressive that they've been able to grow and they've been able to get you know again take more of a confrontational attitude than than some of their competitors. Yeah, Verón, I thought your question to Eric at the Perspectives event even on where do you go next, and he didn't really uh, shy away from the document sharing and things like that, right? And and I and I think and and it's the first analyst event in this space that we've been to where they didn't hammer us with look how great we work with Teams, right? We didn't see any of that. And so they're willing to go toe to toe with them. And I've said, you know, the, the unique thing about Zoom is they're the only vendor in the space, you know, to, to support, you know, what you just said from a research perspective that has the love of the users. Users love Zoom. And uh, so that brings them in to a lot of places. I, I, I know a CEO that recently they were going to put in a competitive product to Zoom and all his users said, we want Zoom, and so he caved and gave him Zoom phone. And I think a lot of that traction in Zoom phone is coming through the user channel, which is very unique in this space. Yeah, and don't forget, you know, phone is a weak spot for Microsoft when it comes to that whole collaboration yeah. suite, right? They've got to go with partners, and you know, Operator Connect is it's not that it's not the ideal solution, especially for smaller businesses. And uh, yeah, as you say, I'm with you on that one, Erwin. It's totally head to head with Microsoft because the market wants to have alternatives and they've figured out what's they just keep adding stuff that makes it stickier and stickier and as long as they keep succeeding they're just going to keep adding new things to make it a total alternative and they can do it yeah and and yeah. they need to i mean if i was looking at their quarterly uh revenue over the last uh, 10 or so quarters 
And um, of course, they had that great spike that took place in 2020 and 2021 through the pandemic. Um, but what they're doing is they, they're maintaining solid earnings, but they still require maintenance and feeding of that. And, and, and uh, I think their investment in AI is going to be important. But I think what's key here to this is this is kind of that hidden dragon or the hidden tiger, whatever the right term is here, that people weren't really paying attention to. And, and if, if this is a solid annual recurring revenue, this is great to support that ongoing revenue stream that they need. Absolutely. So shall we move on to our next story today? It's around WhatsApp. Um, I'm super aware I'm talking to um, a, a group of North Americans here where WhatsApp is not as prevalent. <laughs> But um, I'm, so, I'm a bit surprised we're not hearing more from the Meta camp on WhatsApp. You know, there's been some business features seeping into the uh, the application over the last few years. Um, and obviously, we know WhatsApp has a huge, a huge base of users as well to potentially convert down the line as well. So uh, the latest feature that has um, come to market has been call scheduling. So this allows group uh, users to plan calls in advance and then notify other participants um, when when calls are happening. Um, so this is a, another sort of business feature for the app. Um, this is off the back of screen sharing, which was released not too long ago as well. So the, these business features are coming in into the platform. Uh, I mean, what do we think about WhatsApp? Is 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 WhatsApp going to be a, a credible alternative potentially down the line to the likes of you know zoom and teams of, as we've been discussing already um evan what what do you think do you think this could be a, a dis disruptive force in the market well I, I think so i'm a big user of whatsapp and uh, as an enterprise of one so not not a great uh uh start to the conversation but uh, what many people in the U.S. don't appreciate that is that the world runs on WhatsApp. I mean, 2.7 billion monthly active users. It's growing by about 15 to 20 percent a year, which is kind of unheard of for a business of that size. And it's if you look at all the lists, it's always the number one messaging app. And, and so it, it, it has this incredibly dominant position that, that you know, the challenge is. I like WhatsApp because it's so simple, it's so easy to use, it's so, so straightforward. When you begin to layer all this complexity and video and features, you know, will uh, will that confuse existing users? And is it enough to appeal to business users, you know, beyond the kind of small businesses or SMBs that are using WhatsApp uh, as kind of an ad hoc collaboration tool so I, I think they have the work cut out out for it in the enterprise for sure. I mean, these features are great, but they're they're still pretty simple compared to you know enterprise communications solutions out there. There's just tons of caution, concern around data privacy and data protection with Facebook, um, and you know it's all all about marketing in the enterprise these days. And WhatsApp is still viewed uh, and is an over the top you know, service. So, you know, can it compete with a Teams or, or Zoom for those key global 2000? Uh, unlikely, but it's, it's no doubt it'll be adopted. Adoption will continue for, for small business owners and it will be, you know, increasingly the default platform of choice for customer service and contact center where they've opened up the API and much interaction driving uh, customer service these days is on WhatsApp internationally, that is. so. It'll be fun to watch, interesting to watch. And um, as a user, I'm kind of excited to try some of the new features. Yeah, actually, I think you're the right type of company though, Evan. The the, the enterprise of one, right, is is really, <laughs> you know, kind of a small business is their sweet spot. And it's a good B2C tool, but they've got a long way to go if they're gonna try and do anything more than small business. So. Yeah, but that's okay. I mean, it's like yeah. Erwin, you said, yeah, Zoom is a platform, so is WhatsApp. And it's really sticky for people who use it. And it doesn't have to compete head on with those guys and then it shouldn't, but it creates enough kind of diversion in the marketplace to keep everybody on their toes. And it's just, it's really good at what it does. And, I, and I'm with you, Evan. I mean, you know, there's a big difference to me between communication and collaboration, right? I mean, communication doesn't need all the fancy bells and whistles. If we just have to have efficient ways of getting in touch, you know, the Gen Z's, I mean, text and messaging, this is what they do. It's perfectly valid for, for that set of needs. And uh, that can be enough. 
you know, I, I, as you say, Evan, it's widely used outside of the U.S. And I, I saw the same thing with WeChat in China. It's just like it's the go to for everything there. And that's just how it works. You yeah, know? It's, and, it's almost a social network as well. People don't realize that there are WhatsApp groups of thousands, yeah. tens of thousands of people that can uh, private uh, groups that really drive behavior and consumption of news and content in much of the world. So, yeah, it's probably the biggest bright spot at Facebook these days. In, in that way, I, I, I think of it a lot more like Discord. Um, and, and, and David, to bring it back to the question about screen sharing, you know, FaceTime actually introduced share, uh, screen sharing a couple of years ago, but I wouldn't say we saw that drive enterprise adoption as, as a use case. Um, mm -hmm. But I like what Evan pointed out because I didn't think about this. If it's an end user's choice app um, and it opened up the APIs, what it does create an interesting opportunity is for other UC platforms to drive integration and talk to customers where they want to be talked to. Customer support, go to the My WhatsApp uh, link and, and log on. Screen share from your phone or something like that if you need to show me something that's taking place as well too. I think they have an interesting ancillary play that entrenches them further as a consumer product of choice, kind of along the lines of what WeChat did, which, which uh, John brought up and what X is hoping to do here in the future, I guess. I think the, the customer service space is, is definitely huge. Um, we see a lot of interest in, in integrating contact center into WhatsApp using the WhatsApp business platform. Um, I think, you know, one of the areas of interest here in the U.S., again, being U.S. specific, is a lot of companies, a lot of financial regulated industry or organizations are getting fined billions of dollars because employees are using apps like WhatsApp and you know, Signal and some of the others that are out there to communicate with customers and to have privilege, have conversations that are outside of enterprise compliance control. You know, it was a, a half a billion dollar fine recently here in the US. Uh, so I think organizations need to not ignore uh, apps like WhatsApp. Uh, you probably have a safe assumption that your employees are using those for business purposes outside of the, the platforms that you're using today. So it's something you want to think about, at least from a, a security and integration perspective. And, and how can you potentially federate the messaging application you're using within your organization out into services like WhatsApp? So shall we move on to our final story of the day? Um, we're going to be talking about, did we get the move back to the office right? Now, we've seen uh, quite a few stories over the last few months where big companies, notably AWS, Zoom, uh, Microsoft as one as well, that did a sort of a, a partial U-turn on their remote working policies. This is fascinating to watch, especially for the, these particular companies who are the sort of the poster children for the the remote working um, during the pandemic. So what do our panel think? Should we go to Zeus on this one? You know, did, did we get to the move back to the office right? And you know, where are we with this sort of hybrid working situation now? What do you, what do you think? Well, at, at UC Expo last year, so that was almost a year ago, I remember doing a panel on this and I said that it, would, it, it has been and will continue to be a disaster for companies. And it has been. I, I In fact, I can't think of one company other than maybe Cisco, right? They put a lot of effort into return to work. They've spent a lot of money redoing offices that's actually gotten return to work right. Almost every company though that, you know, since the, over the last year that's tried to mandate return to work, it's, it's blown up in their face. And if they make it voluntary, nobody comes back to work. And it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, I, I remember uh, Chuck Robinson on CNBC saying, you have to make the office a magnet, not a mandate. Well, that's 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 difficult to do, and I've talked to companies that have tried to redo the in, inside of their offices and do things to attract workers back, but people don't come back without some kind of incentive. So now companies are spending money on, you know, free breakfast, lunch, and dinner if you come back to the office, and you know all these perks they've added in, but now it's costing them more money. And so I I don't know any company that's really done a great job of return to work, and in fact, more often than not. You wind up getting punched in the nose in the media for doing that, and and looking like a bad guy, right? And and I think that that's the thing that happened to Zoom. And all they said was one more day instead of just Wednesday, has got to come in Tuesdays. That's you know, <laughs> and you think about the way we work through. Everyone's gone to the office through the history of work, right? And now we're asking people to come back just two days a week, and it's, it's blowing up in companies' faces. And I don't, I don't know if we've actually figured this out yet, Dave. I think it's going to continue to be a struggle. I think there'll be a you know, sometime in the distant future, we'll be going to the office, but I just, I don't know when that's going to be. It certainly doesn't seem like it's anytime soon, though. 
You know, one of the things that, that really I find interesting, um, and I agree with you, I don't think anyone has necessarily worked it out. Um, no one's nailed but, it. But no one's nailed it. You're right. There, it's that there's still this focus on the word where people are working as opposed to how they're working. Now, I know this kind of gets into some warm and light and difficult to kind of uh, substantiate ideas. But I think what took place is there was a lot of ripping away of how we were managing people, ripping away of how people were getting work done, what was considered to be productivity. Um, and it got all tossed aside in the last couple of years. And as businesses are trying to figure this out again, um, the, the, the key point winds up being where. And I really think it needs to be how. So that magnet versus mandate. Well, what are those driving factors to get people together, whether it be productivity reasons, creativity reasons, um, you know, uh, whatever it is. Here's an interesting stat. Steelcase actually just did a, a survey of a couple thousand end users. And in that survey, they said the number one reason they, they people said they were going back into the office was actually to have a quiet place to work and a private place to work. I, I don't know how that worked out, but uh, um, I, you need to double click on that data. But, but the point I come back around to is you're right. Um, I don't think many people are getting it right, but I think people are asking the wrong question and they're focusing on the where instead of the how. And, and there's yeah, a lot or the of what, right? Like, yeah. like don't, there's an expression, I think um, one of the consulting firms came up with it, don't commute to compute, which means if you're going to go to oh, the yeah, office yeah. and sit on your computer all day, that's the wrong reason. In fact, um, I remember talking to Snow and Jespo about this and he said, the way he looks at it, there's, there's a few reasons you should go back to the office. Co-creation, innovation, team building, and there was a fourth reason that you can't remember off the top of my head. Food. Not doing That's why you go. Stuff. It's the food. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think it depends on the person. Like to the earlier point, you know, there are people who like to go in the office and have that break from home and not the distractions. And, you know, they, maybe they feel like they work better when they're in an office environment. And that's fine. You know, I think that's ultimately what you judge as success is ensuring that if, if people have a place to come in where they want to work or they feel like we meet better in person. I think we, we get hung up too much in this holy war of, well, it has to be all at home or it has to be all in the office. And, yeah. you know, I think flexibility is what, what works well. I follow uh, Brian Elliott from Slack, uh, runs a group called the Future Forum and published a book about, uh, I guess, a year and a half ago on you know, how to manage remote and virtual teams. And, and they made the argument. You know, that 100 percent remote work is probably not the best and 100 percent in office is probably not the best. And you have to find, you know, the happy medium that, that works for, for an organization. Yeah. Yeah. You need, you need both. Otherwise, you know, there's no return to office to talk about. and There's no hybrid work model to talk about. But I think for Zoom in particular, I, you know, I think there's a potential big payoff here for them when they get their people back in the office more because, their office environment becomes a really good test lab for the kind of products and environments they're trying to create to drive adoption of their offerings, right? So when we've been to their their environment, when we get the walk-arounds, we see how they're using their equipment and setting it up in these meeting spaces and all that stuff and all the digital signage and the room reservations. When they can kind of perfect that, if they can prove that it works for their employees and make that a better experience, that opens up a whole new kind of, I think, level of credibility for what they're doing to take to market and partner with some of the, you know, the corporate real estate guys and the, and the office design people to kind of create these holistic environments that really, as you say, Zayas, that could nail it and say, this is just a better experience than working at home. Gives me the best of both worlds come into two, three days a week. And, uh, that puts, that can put Zoom kind of in a leadership position, much like the way Cisco talks about how they've really put a lot of effort into figuring this yeah. out. And that's what I think you have to do. It's got to be more than just selling technology. I am curious to see what happens with all the commercial real estate, though. Like, you look, Zoom's got a pretty big building in San Jose, and they got people coming in one day a week. And if, you know, Eric's successful, then two days a week. But that's still that's like, well, boy, two days a week to have <laughs> to have that building there. There's... That, you know, maybe companies should look to split time in a building where one company uses the space Mondays, Tuesdays, and others, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, something like that. But there's there's an awful lot of money being spent on real estate. One of the New York banks is people coming in once a month, right? So, you know, that's um, that's, a, that's a lot of money you spend on real estate for very little time in the office. It, it, it's it's all that part of that churn that's being exposed. What's the business strategy? What's your corporate real estate strategy? How are you managing people? How are you managing productivity? Um, it all got turned on its head. There was a bit of plaque in, uh, on how we were doing business. It was, you came in, you sat down, you did it. I measured you there. I, 
I gave you a space. And with that plaque being ripped away, that, that's what we're all struggling with. Yeah. John, by the way, what you were calling is, I like to call that the transition from the phrase, uh, eating your own dog food to when Zoom you know, figures it out to drinking your own champagne. So it's going from dog food to champagne in that, in that regard. <laughs> But it's not it's not just the equipment, though. It's like, how do you get people to do the right activities? Right. Yes. And, you know, that the, the space is one thing. The, um, when I was at uh, EC this year, Zoom actually sponsored a CIO event uh, that I went to. And um, one of the CIOs of a bank was saying that we built the space out, but people didn't use it. And one of the questions Gary Sorrentino asked was, well, did you have a culture, a collaborative culture before the pandemic? And they said, well, no, not really. It's like, well, then. Why did you think buildings, it's not an if you build it, they will come. Like you've got to, you can build it, but if people weren't used to going in a room and collaborating, just because there's a space now, it doesn't mean they're all of a sudden going to, you know, find, you know, this new way of working, right? And I think in addition to the space, you do need that kind of culture change, but that's a long transitional change, right? It's people have worked a certain way. In fact, I think work from home has made us work independently even more. So now you go back to the office, you're just working groups. That's a that's a really big change. Yeah, absolutely is. And uh, yeah, I think you're right with your, your prediction for this year. Yes, it has been a bit of a disaster. I am looking forward to the prediction for 2024. So uh, stay tuned yeah. for the end of the year when we'll be doing another round robin with our panelists uh, for those predictions for hybrid working next year. So uh, I think that's a great place to end uh, today's discussion. I'd just like to say thank you to Erwin, Zeus, Craig, Evan and John for joining me and sharing some of your insights. And that's it from me. You've been watching UC Today. My name is David Dungay. See you next time.